indeed through Twitter using that hashtag, hash LSG webinar. But that's probably enough from me, uh, Don Taylor, your host, going through the, the housekeeping. Um, it's now time to pass over to our speaker today, Mike Baker of Cornerstone On Demand, who's going to be taking us through learning in a social world, a topic I'm sure we're all interested in, which is why more than 100 people have turned up today to, to listen to it. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Don. Um, and uh, hello, everyone. It's uh, great to see so many people uh, joining the webinar from all over the world, really. Uh, I thought well, maybe we might get into a, a shipping forecast on the weather there for a little bit. But uh, <laughs> um, but look, no, uh, great, uh, and thank you for everyone for your attendance and taking the time to, uh, to join today. Um, I work for Cornerstone On Demand. For those of you who may not know who we are, Cornerstone is the leading provider of uh, SaaS-based unified talent management software. Um, I run our client success program for uh, Northern Europe uh, at Cornerstone, and uh, I'm going to talk to you today about learning in a social world. So I, I guess I'd start with a, with a question, and, and that's really how do you use social media? How do people uh, in the audience today use social media um, or Web 2.0 technologies in your learning programs or, or in your company today? Hmm. I see a few, uh, a few uh, interesting elements coming through on there, and I think that reflects, um, you know, coming through on the chat there, I think that reflects that there, there, there really is a, a very wide and varied approach or strategy, if you like, to how social media and Web 2.0 is, is, is embraced and, and how that's being worked as part of a learning strategy. So what I'm really going to talk about uh, today is, is, is three elements, is social and the impact it's having in the business world. Uh, specifically within uh, uh, HR and learning today. Building a culture of continuous learning and how social media and, and the digital space plays into that. And then some ideas around implementing a uh, social learning strategy or, or a strategy for, for social learning. So really today, I think what's, what's most important is that we now live in a, in a social, collaborative and on-demand world. Uh, people expect information to be at their fingertips. They expect it to be fast, relevant, and accessible everywhere. So really in that context, with the, with the pace of technology and industry moving so quickly, uh, it's not the businesses no longer really need a, a social learning strategy, but a strategy for delivering learning and education in that social world and in the world that we live in. And that, that doesn't mean that you have to scrap traditional learning or um, traditional learning methods such as instructor-led training or e-learning. Um, but it also doesn't mean that you have to blanket adopt social media either. I think what I want to talk today about is how you can use social in a blended approach to help bridge that gap between uh, created by the, the technology revolution that we're living through today. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how companies need to push training in real time uh, by integrating with traditional learning. Um, and use social media either as a platform or as a promotional tool um, to deliver learning to where people congregate. So I think it kind of goes without saying, and most people will be aware of this, that social media really has become the, you know, a huge force in, in, in our society and our culture today. But it's also become the primary communication tool on the web. And that, that's interesting in a couple of ways because it, it now dominates the communication that we have online, which is increasingly dominating the way we communicate generally. Um, and what we're seeing is that over 82% of online population now uses social media uh, to communicate, to share content, to access information. And, and that's across all age groups. And I think that's one of the most interesting statistics is that this is not just affecting your emerging workforce or your millennial workforce or whatever you like to call it. And actually the, the fastest growing group within that is the 55 or plus 55 age group. So why are people using social and, and web 2.0 today? Well, this is a chart from a company called eConsultancy who are a respected digital consultancy firm in the UK. And what it shows is that Primarily, people are using social media for inspiration and information, product reviews, recommendations, opinion, or in other words, they're, they're using it for knowledge and learning, to learn more about their particular subject matter or area of interest. And I often use 
a, a, a very simple anecdote for how that affects the way people learn today. Uh, if I'm going to go buy a TV, for example, um, my learning experience around that purchase is vastly different to what it was 10 years ago. So today, before I even walk into a store, I'm going to be probably doing some research online around the specific TVs that, that, that suit my needs. Then when I get into the store, I'm going to speak to a salesperson who's going to give me a run through of the features and functions of that specific TV. And if you like, that's your traditional instructor-led training. And that's very valuable. But as I walk out of the store, I'm probably going to open my smartphone and I'm going to go onto Facebook and ask my peer groups what they think of the latest Panasonic or Sony TV that I've just seen and get their feedback. When I get home, I'm going to flip up my laptop. I'm going to go onto which magazine and look at reviews. I might look at Twitter to see if there's been any negative feedback on their after-sales service. So you can see that my, my learning experience in buying that TV has now been greatly extended. It, it's no longer a, a one-time learning event that I go in and I, I get some information from a face-to-face uh, -face, um, person and then make my decision. Mike, or, or, yes. quick question, of which we've had, and I should have picked this up yesterday. Um, the bar types, what are the three colours referring to there? Uh, that's good. good question, because uh, I've, I've got the, the bottom of the, uh, the, the chart cut off at the moment. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it, it really is referring to um, how it has changed over time and, and how people are um, using the web and, uh, from uh, periods over time. But I'll have to come back to you on that because, I've, as I said, I've cut the actual bottom off um, in terms of how that relates. But it, it relates to time and it relates to um, the medium, so whether it's social media, um, traditional web or, or mobile handset use. Okay. So yeah, so just, just coming back to that, uh, you know, in terms of how social fits within a learning framework, it, it really is um, social and Web 2.0, which I think, or digital, if you like, uh, you know, are intertwined. It's it's not like social sits out there on its own. I think it's a part of the whole digital re revolution, if you like, and and how that's affecting the way people gain knowledge. So, really, then, what we can see is, given that learning is acquiring new or modifying existing knowledge, behaviours, skills, values, preferences, etc and that social media provides a platform for individuals and communities to share and discuss skills and content, there's obviously a, you know, a very natural partnership that, that sits between those two mediums. So there's a real opportunity to use social media to provide a continuous, non-formal, if you like, learning experience. And what that gives you in this context is, is space for communities and individuals to learn informally and continuously from one another. And, and, and as a result, that's, that's often more powerful than traditional formal learning platforms because it's more relevant. Because what we're doing today is we're trusting our peer group or we're becoming more trusting of our peer group than we have been in the past. So what does that mean in, in, a, uh, in a business context? How is that affecting businesses today? This is a slide uh, of some statistics from Burson and Associates. Uh, and uh, how social and, and Web 2.0 is, is really infiltrating the business um, environment. And what these statistics show are, are quite contradictory in many ways because it's, it's showing that companies that are using Web 2.0 technologies are achieving much, much higher uh, increases in engagement in learning uh, against those who don't. Who don't. Um, and that the majority of organisations that are using those technologies are really achieving best in class performance. And when you consider that today we have a war on talent, we have to be more efficient with the workforces, workforce that we have, we have to get more from less, budgets are squeezed, using technology to empower your workforce uh, is showing you know, statistically that, that that is going to have a, a big effect. However, the contradiction is, is that yet only less than 30% of organisations are using social networking as part of their corporate intranet. Um, and that's primarily a, you know, a, a fear of change or um, not understanding how to incorporate that into your, your culture. But you've got a, a nearly 40% of your emerging workforce of your 18 to 24 year olds would consider leaving if they weren't allowed to access applications like Facebook and YouTube. Now, 
I smile when I say that because many companies would say, well, we don't want people accessing, our, <laughs> accessing Facebook and YouTube on company time anyway. But what that really reflects is that that emerging workforce, that, that next generation of, of, of talent that is coming into your business expect and have grown up with a social experience. So if you aren't able to offer them a social experience, and it may not be Facebook, it may be a corporate social media platform, then they're going to consider going to your competition. So this is a, a, a case study, if you like, of, of Virgin Media who are a client of, of Cornerstones um, and how they've used social media by, to, to empower their learning program. What Virgin Media have done is they've embraced blended learning approach to create a cost effective uh, and a superior adoption of, of continuous learning. So they haven't just said we're going to put everything social. What, they, what they're doing is that they're delivering um, courses and in fact in some cases entire degrees via virtual learning environments and e-learning and they're using social media as, in two ways. One to promote and socialise that training but also to capture feedback and improve the content of that training uh, in real time. So by using e-learning and then social media to, to promote the training and drive adoption of those training courses, um, Virgin Media have saved over £100,000 on what they spent on traditional instructor-led training approaches. So you can see that it has a direct effect using that uh, analogy or using that example um, to, to the bottom line and, and what you, training is costing you. So where does that leave us? I mean, ultimately, I think using those statistics and case studies and the fact that social is, is all-encompassing in the world that we live in today, you can see that by harnessing the social revolution and, and embracing it, you really have an opportunity to energise your learning development as well as empowering your people, improving efficiency and retention um, while saving you cost. And I think that may be the, the biggest factor that many people are looking at in, in L&D today. Um, and in the, in the process of doing that, you're, you're becoming more competitive in the war on talent and making your um, organisation and L&D departments uh, more attractive. Mike, so, there's, yes. there's a bit of background noise coming through from somebody. I'm not sure it's coming from you or if we've got some sort of cross line. There seems to be some noise coming from somewhere else. Mm. Um, so is there any background noise where you are at the moment? No, I'm in a, uh, a bunker-style room with uh, <laughs> no one around. So. Uh, I'm sure that Cornerstone Demand have splendid rooms and aren't bunker-style at all. Mm -hmm. um, are, okay, so I'm, I'm not quite sure where this is coming from because delegates and, and speakers have different dial-ins. But if you, are in a, if you are dialed into this, we clearly have got some interference. So if you're dialed into the call, then please could you make sure that your handset where you are is on mute, so we're not picking up any background noise. Or if you can't do that, just tell the people around you to be quiet. Clearly, we've got some interference. Okay, sorry to interrupt you, Mike. Back to you. No, that's fine. Um, and please, if anybody needs me to repeat anything and they didn't hear anything clearly, then then uh, let Don know and he can interrupt me again. Um, so, in terms of the, the next phase in the agenda, is is really how you can use social media and digital to to build a, a culture of continuous learning. So this is my, you know, my, my Dilbert slide, if you like, and I think every good presentation should have a Dilbert slide in it. I think what, what I'm trying to reflect with this, with this slide is really that we now live in a world where the technology we use at home is probably better than what we use in the workforce or in the workplace. We have smartphones and tablets and superfast broadband and Macs and um, have all those at home and, and, and that's what we're using today. But we also, and, and this is important, we also now regularly access best of breed cloud technologies at home as part of our everyday lives. So Facebook, iTunes, Google, YouTube, etc. As we consume more and more technology in our personal lives, we expect to be able to use a similar technology or get that similar experience in the workplace. And, and, and this is a concept that you may be aware of, which is the consumerization of technology uh, in, in the corporate environment. So with that in mind, having applications that allow you to access knowledge and training uh, with that same level of experience that you get from those consumerized products is becoming an expectation of many people in the workforce today. So it, it's important to recognize that in, in your L&D strategy. 
this um, next slide is, is, is really what it's all about in, in terms of continuous learning. And this is a, a great representation from, again, from Burson and Associates and how a continuous learning program would work. I think that in many ways, informal learning in inverted commas has now become a, a buzzword or, or a main, well, less of a buzzword and more of a mainstream topic. And, and really having a blended, continuous approach to learning and development uh, has be, is becoming what needs to happen for continual um, learning and retention over time. So what we can see with this slide is that we're not, as I said at the beginning, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. What we're saying is that, that you can use all the elements available around uh, learning and, and training and education to deliver a, a higher retention and therefore greater adoption, greater efficiency, um, greater return on investment. So in this case, certainly delivering training on demand via e-learning courses so people can um, access their training and development uh, in their own time at their own pace. Providing coaching and mentoring, sure, and that may be something that happens formally on the job, but, and I'll come on to the disparate workforce at the, in, in a minute, that could also be delivered via video uh, or, or streaming. Tying that back to your career development and making it relevant to increase adoption. And then using social media to create uh, and promote that training, but also create communities of practice. So getting groups of, of individuals in the same job role or with the same interests or um, with the same um, with, with the same learning tasks and letting them to discuss and, and understand more and get more in depth about their learning experience. And then obviously doing that via mobile, so making it accessible everywhere. And you can see that if you compare that to a traditional training program, the, 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 the curve to, to attaining knowledge is, is, is faster and steeper and then um, plateaus over time rather than diminishing. So really today we live in, we have a, a flexible, widespread workforce. That may mean that you have people in your organisation who are doing the same job role who are in different countries. It may mean that you have people doing the same job role in different offices. It may mean that you have an extended enterprise of partners, suppliers, um, resellers, for example, who aren't actually part of your organisation at all, who you also need to empower with learning and, and skills based on, on your company. So within this environment, the connection point becomes technology. And the, you know, the water cooler moment, if you like, or the, the opportunity for informal learning within this borderless um, workplace that we now live in really becomes uh, technology and how you can harness that to uh, deliver learning to your workplace. But that offers us a conundrum, obviously, is that how do you provide that continuous learning experience when you have a borderless workplace? And, and organisations today really need to manage knowledge transfer like they never have before and, and to support those new ways of working. You know, allowing people to collaborate and learn informally when they're not in the same physical location. And, and how do you provide monitoring, uh, sorry, mentoring and, and, and project feedback? Um, a good example or a real life example is another Cornerstone client is the Money Advice Trust uh, who use the, a, Cornerstone product called Connect, which is a, a social platform um, for 95, uh, for all of their users, 95% of which are external to the trust. So their objective is to provide a platform for all money advisors across the UK to share best practice and provide support for those advisors who are isolated from anybody else doing a similar role. So, so they've used a, a social pl platform in this case to um, allow conversation and, and bridge that gap from the fact that people are not working in the same location. Another way that, that companies are using social media to bridge that, board, that, that borderless workforce gap is through crowdsourcing. And as companies become bigger and, and more borderless, they also become more complex. And therefore, the ability to share benefits and best practice in the form of knowledge sharing has become more important. And, and social collaboration and crowdsourcing is a great way of doing that. Now, that can be internally 
and obviously user generated content becomes a, a very important factor in terms of relevance and cost. Um, as, as companies become very, very large and very, very disparate, creating relevant content to all of the people in your organization um, becomes very time consuming and very expensive. So allowing user generated content through crowdsourcing and listening to your employee base becomes a very effective way of doing that. Another great example of crowdsourcing how that can work um, to bridge a knowledge gap specifically um, is going outside of your organization to, to fill that knowledge gap. And we work with a partner at Cornerstone who are a, a development company and they use crowdsourcing to reach out to a community of developers around the world with a specific development problem or, or challenge that they're trying to resolve that they don't have the, the knowledge uh, or workforce uh, internally to be able to do themselves. And they offer, they offer small incentives or prizes to the developer or development team who can solve that problem for them. So they're outsourcing or crowdsourcing the, the, the knowledge gap that they have within their own organization in, in order to be more cost effective and more, uh, more efficient. But yeah, I think you know, crowdsourcing is becoming a key element of a continuous learning goal and an enabler for, for the future organization. Obviously, one of the key things around uh, social is, is your ability to collect that data. So one of the most important things that I'm, I'm sure that, that everybody struggles with is how do you report understand uh, and use the data that you're collecting from your learning programs in, in, a, in, a, in an effective way. So being able to, to collate multiple conversations and collaborative efforts uh, and store those in a central searchable format it becomes a very, very efficient way of spreading knowledge across your, your business. And an example of that was a, a previous company where I worked. We had a, a team of engineers uh, who worked in my department and when a particular issue would come up um, with how to, to, to create something in the software that we were doing, an, an email would go out to everybody on that distribution list. It might have been 100 people saying, sorry for the spam, but does anybody know how to fix this problem? Have has anyone come across this issue before? Um, it's a fairly common practice in a lot of businesses today and I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. What would happen is there'd be a fantastic response and you know, 20 or 30 emails would fly back saying, yeah, I've done that before and this is how we resolved it and this is how we fixed that particular issue for this particular client or whatever it might be. Um, and that problem would be solved. And then three months later, we'd have a new starter in that engineering team or um, it would be someone who was already there who had lost or deleted that email chain would ask exactly the same question all over again and everybody else would, would then have to respond. So an incredibly inefficient use of of knowledge sharing because you, you're losing so much time and, and efficiency in doing it that way. So we overcame that problem by instigating a, uh, a social platform where we could move that conversation from email into an area where we could manage the collaboration, make it searchable so that when that you had that new starter again, that onboarding person, when that problem came up again, you could um, easily go and search for that particular issue and find the answer without having to involve the entire global engineering force. So obviously that then gives you a lot of data to be able to, uh, or data, I'm never sure how I'm supposed to say that, um, to drive your future learning programs and, and will save you money whilst increasing success. So really now I'm going to talk about implementing a social strategy and some high level tips and tricks and, and ideas for, for how that might work. I think probably the first point to, to talk about is the biggest challenge for adoption of social or, or, or digital or web 2.0, whatever you want to call it, as part of a blended or continuous learning program is the fear of change or inaction. And I think this is partly because a lot of organizations still feel that training is only relevant in a classroom or that email is the best way to drive engagement. Um, however, I don't think having a one-size-fits-all approach um, is right. It makes businesses less agile and, and it makes training and, and content less relevant to everybody. So this comes back again to using that blended continuous approach where you're allowing for a continuous learning. You recognize the audience uh, and content as key decision factors in your approach and use social where it's going to be most effective. So it doesn't have to be a 
big bang, we're rolling out social to our entire global workforce, but using it where it's, where it's relevant. Um, an example of, uh, would be something like, um, depending on your workforce, you'll have some elements or, or some content that is more you, um, suited to instructor-led training or classroom, while uh, gamification or social reward is going to be more relevant or more accepted by different elements of, of, uh, of your working community. This is, the, this is a quote by a, a, a chap called um, Arthur Nielsen of uh, AC Nielsen Market Research. and He made this quote uh, several years ago while discussing why companies should embrace and invest in the web. And I, I think that you know, it's still a very, I mean obviously today the, the web is a part of every business that we use and I think it's still a very relevant, a relevant comment when you're talking about um, social media. It, it, really, it's what it's saying in essence is it's better to do something than nothing. That when you're looking at what your competitors' learning and development teams are doing, when you're looking at what your, your companies are doing in the war on talent, um, it's really a question of, it's not whether you can afford to invest in social as a learning channel it's, it, or, or enabler, it's a question of whether you can afford not to. So starting small and targeted is okay, but I think doing nothing is, is probably more costly than, than doing something. So again, a question for the audience, before I go into some ideas on this, what are the top tips for using social media or, or digital in, in your learning programs or your workplace today? And, and interestingly, Mike, of course, we've already had some of the questions, some, some points and tips being raised as we go on. I suggest this is going to be a, a big point of discussion when we get to the end of the presentation. And, and rightly so. Um, lots of great ideas. Marie says, very simply, have a plan, <laughs> which has got a lot to recommend it. Um, and also, I think Jasmine's point, don't, don't just try to replace it. Use what you've got already and complement it with social, which I think is very much what you're saying, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I, I'd, be very, <laughs> I'd be very concerned if, if companies with established learning and development practices went out today and, and scrapped all of their content um, for user-generated content and scrapped all of their uh, instructor-led training for uh, collaboration because I, I don't think that that's going to have a positive effect. But it, it's about understanding and, and looking at where it's going to have the biggest effect, where social media will have a positive effect on your business. Absolutely. I know it's John saying, don't use it for the sake of it. And a lot of people like Vinny, oh, sorry, Vivine saying, give an introduction to how it's used, help people. Jess saying, encourage its use. Chris saying, give guidance, create a culture. There's a sort of feeling, I think, amongst certainly some members here, that uh, you can't just throw it out there. You have to encourage it in some way. Actually, at the end of the session, I, I won't interrupt now, but I'll talk about how we've got the Learning and Skills Group website up and running, how that's been a success, to share some thoughts about that. Um, lots of great ideas coming through. Wow, that's great. Please keep them coming through. Um, Mike, back to you. Yeah, sure. And, and I think just on that, that point, as I, as I move on to the next slide, I think um, change management is, is, a big, is, is, is a huge consideration when you, when you do these things. And I'll talk a little bit about more uh, some of the considerations around change in, in a moment. But the other, the other point is, is really you know, in creating a culture, which I, I think was a fantastic, a fantastic point because if you have a war between strategy and culture, then culture always wins. So you might have the, the most wonderful strategy for how you're going to deliver learning in this social world that we live in. If, if that's not culturally um, embraced by your, by your business and by your workforce based on their demographic, job role, et cetera, then it's not going to succeed. Um, but certainly in terms of how you, you know, some ideas for using social, and I think we've talked about it, this a lot already, is, is it, it's not a blanket adopt or reject. Look to where you can complement what you're doing today. Um, adopt it in a specific measurable fashion, fashion if you like. So you, know, you look at where, um, where you, you may have small groups of people who are specifically um, benefited from collaboration where you can create small groups uh, of um, of employees and then measure the success of that. And if it's successful, then you can look to widen that group rather than just pushing it out to your entire workforce and then trying to manage that change. Um, if it doesn't be delivered benefits, be realistic about the project. Uh, I think that 
uh, it's a, uh, you know, being Australian, this is a bit of an Australian expression, but there's no point flogging a dead horse. So if, if you, you've, you've pushed out a, a social um, element to your training and it's not delivering the benefits that you had when you put together that plan, as someone said, you know, you have that, that cost-benefit analysis that you have when you put together any sort of plan for, for new technology. If it's not delivering against that, then be pragmatic and be realistic about um, how that's being achieved. And look at where social media will be useful, and that's going to come down to, uh, again, groups, demographic, technographic, et cetera, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. This is uh, my Douglas Adams quote, if you like, and uh, I like it because I think it sums up a lot of the way people think and feel about new technology today. And, and you know, there's a set of rules that anything was in, that was in the world when you were born is normal and natural, and anything invented between when you were 15 and 35 is new, revolutionary, exciting, and you'll probably get a career in it. And anything invented after you're 30, 35 is against the natural order of things. And I think that's humorous, but it also <laughs> sums up a lot of how people feel about new technology. But I, but I also think that it's important to recognise that it's really a, a, a point of understanding how you want to engage with your employee base because engagement can be a killer for adoption and return on investment in any learning program. So understanding and listening to your audience um, you know, and how you're going to use social media is going to be important. So for example, if you have an intranet and you want to socialise that, for example, but nobody is using the intranet today, then perhaps that's not the best starting point. But it's, it's also about understanding your technographic and as opposed to your demographic. So just because, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, the, the plus 55 age group is the fastest growing um, group in social media today. So just because you are over 35 doesn't mean that you're not going to adopt and engage with a social experience from a technological perspective. Equally, um, you may have a, a young workforce in a, you know, a, a factory environment or a blue collar environment where they don't have access to PCs. So even though demographically they fit the social um, plan, if you like, they're not necessarily going to benefit from a social program. So it's about understanding your audience and, and what is going to be most effective. Understanding where your employees congregate and what is going to be the most effective channel for using social media will also be very important. I think this is really about where people go to do their jobs today. And I think you know, with a lot of companies, there are a lot of systems, a lot of places where people go to, to find out information. And by simply creating another system that people need to log into to collaborate or, or share or learn isn't necessarily going to be the most effective channel to drive in, in engagement. So a good example of that would be sales and marketing. So sales and marketing typically will spend their lives in a CRM. Uh, it might be Salesforce or it might be something else. Being able to integrate your learning experience with that CRM to deliver training in real time in a relevant fashion based on the activity that they're doing suddenly becomes a really creative way of using digital and Web 2.0 to enhance and, and make more relevant the training experience. So the example would be for um, a CRM is that as a salesperson moves a, a prospect from um, from competing, for example, for the business to um, contracts received or, or closed one, um, a, a targeted piece of training then pops up within that CRM at that point and says, you know, here's a short webinar or here's some tips and tricks for closing out the contract and moving that to the next stage. So it's real-time training delivered where people are doing their work today. And I think that's an incredibly important point for, for adoption uh, in your uh, learning program. Measure everything. I think of all the elements of what we do today, digital and social media is incredibly measurable. And in fact, in 2009, which seems like a, a long time ago now, there was more data collected than in the combined histories of mankind. So in every, in every piece of data collected in every year leading up to 2009, there was more data collected in 2009. And that's because of the additional data points being driven 
by the explosion of social media at that, in that period. So what that means is, is that there is a, a lot of data that you can capture that to better inform your, your learning, to make it more relevant, to be able to um, use the, the content that you're creating to, um, or use the data you're collecting on the training courses you're running to make co content more, more effective for your audience. So coming up to sort of my takeaway slide now, if you like, and, and I think this is really just some high-level points to summarise uh, everything I've, I've talked about so far. And uh, Your internal training should have a social component. We do live in a social world. People expect that experience. They have that experience at home. They have that experience in their personal lives. It, it is a way of living. It's a cultural shift in our society. It's affecting all elements of, of the HCM world from recruitment to talent from how people search and look for jobs to how they expect to be onboarded and trained in jobs to how they expect their, their peer group feedback to, to happen. And social can either be a platform for collaboration, and, and, a, and a great example that I haven't given on that so far is uh, another Virgin Media example, which is uh, they had a, a, an issue with some store managers on a Sunday performing better than other store managers, so they created a targeted group within a social platform for those store managers to collaborate on, on tips and tricks and ideas for being successful. So it can be uh, a, a single component or, or platform for delivering content, or it can be part of a continuous learning strategy where you're allowing f continuous feedback and measurement to be able to uh, um, capture that conversation and, and improve. I think it's important to recognise that one size fits all doesn't work, and I think that that's pretty clear from the feedback on, on the chat. Um, and it's about understanding your employee demographics as well as their technographics and how, um, how responsive to technological change they are uh, and you know, what's going to work. And you know, gamification will work for some people and social rewards f for some people, but that won't work for everybody. And that concludes my presentation. So thank you very much. Um, the only thing is left for me to do is, is I'm obliged by our marketing department to give a plug for our next event, which um, will be a, a new model for Integrated Talent Management Unleashed, um, which is uh, we're doing in conjunction with Burson. Um, if you'd like to find out more information, please contact me on any of those details below. Thank you very much. Mike, that was really fascinating. Thank you. I mean, you can see by the amount of activity we've had in the chat area, uh, you can tell how engaged people have been, how much you've stimulated people in this. And look, you've got people saying thanks and clapping. A bunch of stuff has come up in the, uh, in the course of the chat, which I've sort of corralled as we've been going along, to ask you some questions and to stimulate some further discussion. Uh, lots of it. I'm going to jump in straight away with something you kicked off at, at the back uh, end of the presentation there. Measure everything. A couple of questions came up from that straight away. John asked, what metrics would you measure and why? And Billy says, do we regard ROI as time, money, effort, or all three? In other words, again, what should we be measuring? Billy, you've raised your hand. Um, if you want to pop a question, ask a question, Billy, just go ahead and raise it in the text chat area, and I'll pick it up. Don't worry, I've got my eye firmly glued to that. So Mike, measure everything. What should we be measuring? And, and how do we make sure that we get the best impact from what we measure in terms of proving value? Yeah, sure. I think firstly measuring ROI can be done in a number of different ways as, as the, the question alluded to, uh, well the second part of that question alluded to, which is, um, it, you know, are you trying to, in the Virgin Media example for example, just reduce the cost that you're spending on instructor med training today and, and, and that's a very tangible way of showing return on investment. What's less tangible and harder to, um, uh, to, to get your hands around is, what is the return on investment you're getting from creating a more efficient workforce? And obviously a way of, of doing that is, is testing. Um, and a way to drive improvements in those sorts of results is by um, making training more widely adopted and, and, and more relevant. So in terms of measuring, I think what I'm talking about as much as anything is certainly course adoption um, and uh, course completion rates is obviously very important. Um, and I think you then need to tie that back to, um, to relevance. And, and I think part of what you're trying to capture in, in part of that measurement is 
um, the feedback you get on courses. So if you, you run a course and then have a, um, you know, similarly to, to what we're doing today via chat, you, you have a, a forum or a, or a room where people can go and say, well, that training was great, but it wasn't relevant to me in this way, and then for next time you can adopt or adapt that content um, to make it more relevant so that you can then use your social channel to um, promote those changes that you've made to the content. You know, we've received feedback from the last training course, we've made changes, um, and, and then see and measure how that is in increasing adoption rates and, and uh, of training. I mean, obviously, you will always have some compliance training and things that people have to do. Um, but I think looking at how um, you can improve uh, test results or, you know, using that Virgin Store um, result um, example, you know, how can you see sales improving in a retail environment, for example, um, is, is a great way of, um, of measuring success and return on investment outside of the cost you save from you know, traditional um, uh, content or, or uh, instructor-led training costs. I, I would summarise it in a nutshell is go where the pain is. If there's pain in the business, that's what you need to be measuring, either that or a proxy which points towards it. You may not be able to improve sales or prove a direct link, but perhaps you can improve um, the throughput through the store, for example, or, or other things. Um, for me, it doesn't matter whether it's social or any other form of learning, always go where the, where the pain is and measure that point. Billy did ask a question. He said, um, if the training is physical and the feedback physical, but we're using SM social media channels, how can we digitize this? Billy, I'm not quite sure I understand the, um, the question, but I'm going to paraphrase. If I get it wrong, please tell me. Um, so we're doing physical um, training. We've got classroom training. How do we make sure we get the... Um, the use social media channels in order to get the feedback and, and take advantage of the things you've described? Yeah, so I, look, I, think, I think the thing is, you, you know, social media is, is not the traditional way of, of capturing feedback. And I think what you have to do is, it, it, take, it, it takes a bit of a brave, bold step sometimes because it takes people out of their comfort zone, but you have to open it up to, um, to forum and, and say, look, just tell us what you really think. You know, let's let's make it free form and and, and yeah. we'll capture that discussion. I think if you traditionally, you know, you would give a um, you know a feedback form or a, um, a you know a training evaluation form, which is fairly prescriptive. I think that has value because it really targets the areas you can target those feedback forms to to the areas that you're looking to improve. And it's not saying that that's not valuable any longer and you should throw it away. But if you you know, at the end of training courses, make a, a forum or a closed group yep. available on a platform for those attendees to um, go and really share unfettered ideas around that training content. Then I think that's a great way of capturing feedback in that way. Cool. Uh, we, we talked about getting people to go social. There was a, a massive amount of discussion about this before and after and during your point about what you should do next. Um, I just want to try and capture some of that. Then I'll come on to your question, Danielle, about um, media, because I think that's, that's a great question. But I don't want to, I don't want to miss out on the, some of the great topics we had earlier on. So, Mike, very succinctly, um, we had a slightly, a slightly jocular um, comment from Nick, which I, I think had a very serious point behind it. Somebody was asking, should I, Joseph was asking, should I just turn on the social part of my LMS? Nick was saying, yeah, go ahead, just turn it on. But then we had, we had a lot of discussion around that. How do you actually make sure that when, peop, when you have the social stuff out there, people use it and use it properly and use it effectively and that we have the right culture in place uh, so that, and we just had a discussion now pop up about lurkers, people who don't necessarily participate fully but who learn a great deal simply by being there. How do we make sure that all people are served when we go social within an organization? Uh, if you, I, mean, I, know, I know you gave us your top tips, but you just want to reiterate some of the top tips making sure that your, uh, your steps into social are effective. Yeah, well, I, th I think the key thing is is to smart, start small and targeted. Yeah. Um, you know, I think certainly look at and understand your workforce and, and where you're going to have the most effect. And as I said, don't just blanket uh, adopt it. You, you know, I think just you know suddenly turning on a social platform and, and um, expecting people to use it is is not going to work. And as I said before, I think where strategy meets culture, culture wins. Sure. So it, it's a you know, with any technology, whether it's um, LMS software or anything like that, if you have a change, you, you have to 
communicate, sell, sell and sell again. And, and there is an internal selling piece that you need to do around the benefits and, and to individuals about having this. But I think starting small and, and, and targeted with a, a specific group, measuring the success that that's had and then using that to uh, as a basis, if you like, for, for going forward, I think is probably the wisest move. And and make sure it's pointed towards a, a business need. And I think Lorna raised yeah. a really good point. She said, look, when I tried to push social media under learning and development, it was difficult. But when I sold it from a business perspective, management took interest. And as soon as management get involved, then you're on to a winner. Management decide what time, what how people spend their time. And if you don't have them involved, it's very difficult to make this sort of thing work. It, just very quickly, my reflection on having got the Learning and Skills Group website up and running, it, it now has, as I said, over 6,000 people on it. But obviously, we started off with less than that. In fact, we started off with 30 people. And we chose those people quite carefully because there were people who were um, respected in the field, who would set up the right culture, and who would contribute and be active from the start. Having started with that, we then invited more people and more people. But the, the, the key thing was that the people at each stage that we invited were enthusiastic about it and shared their enthusiasm with others. And I think the same is true at work provided you can show value people get enthusiastic about it and spread the good word ideally managers spread the good word across the organization but of course also learners and users do as well jumping on to um uh gosh it was daniel silverstein i think let me just go to that question i can remember the question anyway um very quickly mike uh, do we wait till people get on board or should we be using this form of training uh, for people at the induction stage. Next up, I'm going to ask the question, John, don't worry, about information and learning. But this business, this business from, from Danielle, when do we start with social? At what, pay, what point in people's life in the company are they ready to start doing it? Look, I, personally, and, and look, again, it, social media is like any other technology. Um, it, you know, you have to evaluate it and test it and, and ensure that it's, it's delivering some tangible but, um benefits and, and every business will be different um, because every business is demographic and, and technographic if you like will be different but for me personally I think that um, having people on, on the day they join be included in a group of peers um, within their organization that they can connect with and talk to and, and discuss um, their experiences in, in their first few weeks and months in the company is hugely valuable. So I would be inclined to do it from day one. And we do that at Cornerstone. We, we use our own Connect module for, for social. And when I joined, I was able to go on and um, join a group of, of my peers and, and also search out other people that I wanted to connect with in the company. Um, I'm able to see who they are, see a picture of them. Um, a lot of the time, they're, they're in other areas of the business. Um, and I'm able to go and ask them about what they do and how that fits in with my job role. And, and that's a lot easier than sending emails to people who have already got a thousand emails in their inbox and they don't know who you are or, or what you do. So I think it's a really valuable um, thing to do from, from day one as part of the onboarding process. And in fact, of course, I've seen people doing it, organizations doing it before day one, actually getting the SOMI uh, channels involved when people are in the recruitment stage because they figure actually it sorts out the people who are more likely to be enthusiastic uh, to the people who aren't. Well, um, absolutely. I think, I mean, recruit, social media and recruitment is a whole other topic altogether. And <laughs> it I think is. That that's, that's, that's an important point. But you can also, and I used the example before of Money Advice Trust who are using Connect to um, reach their extended enterprise, there's no reason why you couldn't create sure. groups for people who are in the pre-boarding process. So maybe they've signed a contract, but they're still um, in their notice period from their previous company, and you want to give them a taste of the culture and what to expect when they arrive, and social is a great way of doing that as well. Absolutely. And I think also, yes, it, people are increasingly expecting to pick up on, on the, if you like, the flavor of the culture of a place as well as the sheer information. Social helps with that too. Okay, coming on to John's question, he's been this this was early on in the conversation and a lot of discussion around it information slash learning and it's something which probably merits an hour in its own right what's the difference between information and what is learning uh, just to co just to, to couch this we, we talk about people going to the internet to, to learn things whenever I mention this to audiences when I'm talking I always get the feedback yeah but they're not really learning it they're just finding stuff out my reaction is does it matter uh, if they do their job better as a result. Um, but Mike, what's your reflection on the difference between information, learning, the importance of both? I don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying in that phrase to, to um, belittle the question. It's an important question. But um, 
can you just reflect for us for a minute then, Mike, on the difference for you between information learning and the use of that within an organisation? Yeah, it's a tough, it's a very tough question because it's you know there's a lot of opinion on it. I I think I come back to the the point that there's a place for both um, in, in, in continuous learning and, and what I've talked about in, in having a blended or continuous learning approach. You should definitely still have, uh, there is definitely still a place for e-learning with tests um, to measure success, uh, you know, for instructor-led training. But I think that, that being able to then, um, on the back of an instructor-led training uh, event, for example, which is a you know a pure traditional learning event, to give people the opportunity to find out more information about that course that they can do in their own time over time, either via a social network or via um, their mobile device or whatever it might be, is is only going to um, reinforce the messages or, or the learning that they've had in that traditional environment. So, I think there's I think it, there's a place for both, and I, and I think w what businesses need to do is um, allow people to, to find sources of information from elsewhere because they're going to anyway, um, and, and just formalise that as part of the continuous training program that you're running. It's a good point, and we have lots of useful comments on this as well. I, and I do think it's something worth reflecting on. For me, the key thing about the difference between the two, uh, between information, uh, well, not the difference, between, because they're two different things, one's a verb, one's a noun, but anyway, um, looking at information and learning together, my concern is that uh, we need to provide both to people, but the pace of work today simply means we cannot expect people to learn as much as they used to, for all they may, have to, they may have to learn as much as they used to, but that won't be as enough. We have to provide them with information which they can forget because it's time sensitive and it's moved on. And we, what may, they may learn today may simply not, sorry, the information may simply not be useful in two weeks' time because something's changed. And I think that we have to bear in mind the difference. Uh, and as John Curran says, it links with the resources, not courses mantra. Um, Let's move on in some way, because we could, we could talk about that, and it's a soft topic I'm very interested in. We could, we could talk about that all day long. Um, quickly, culture, Mike. We, we touched on this earlier on when we talked about um, the way of getting people to accept um, social internally. But uh, Nick and Mark Novis and Lorna were talking about this earlier on, talking about um, the, the pushback one often gets in an organization from the idea of anything being social because it's tarred with the brush of, of Facebook and being irrelevant. Um, we've had discussion about this, but what's your take on how to get management in particular to accept that social can be very useful? Well, well I think it, it comes back to the points I made around consumerization uh, of technology in the workplace and the fact that today people expect um, a, a social experience, and, and I, I, I sort of joked about it earlier in the presentation that you, you may not want people looking at Facebook or YouTube, etc., on work time, and, and, and that's you know obviously perfectly acceptable. But I think what what you need, what management need to be helped to understand is that this is the way that people want to communicate. It's increasingly, it is the most popular form of communication. So you need to replace if you don't want people you know, communicating via email, for example, we need to replace that with a corporate social um, experience. And, and social doesn't have to be Facebook. I mean, that, that is a, a consumer product, if you like. Yeah. But there are, there are a number of um, uh, social products for the enterprise which allows that experience without it being, you know, a time waster, you know, because people are talking to their friends. Um, so I think that that's really the education piece is that we need to provide a, provide a, a social experience. People expect it. We're going to have a more engaged workforce. We're going to be more productive, more efficient, um, but it doesn't have to happen on Facebook. Yeah, um, it, it doesn't. And I think we need to persuade people that whatever they've managed, in particular whatever they've heard about Facebook, they, uh, they shouldn't get too uh, hung up about it. There are other ways of... Um, dealing with it. In fact, I've just remembered um, the social media map that I created some time ago. I'm, I'm getting, uh, for use for exactly this reason of, of persuading people or, or using as a tool to um, help people understand, managers in particular, um, what <laughs> what um, the difference between different types of social media is. I'm just going to get that up now, and I'll just drop a link in 
uh, into um, the chat, chat for that. Okay, so um, a lot of other questions coming through. Just follow up on that one. Um, quick question from DRS, I think it was. Um, how do you um, make sure that if people are using social media, that they, are, they feel okay about doing it at work? as opposed to in their own time. A lot of people do do it in their own time, but um, don't we want them to do it at work as well? There's a bit of a perception they're skiving off if they, if they are doing it at work. Mm. Well, I think it comes back to the, the perception of what social media is, and, and uh, Don, I think you, you, your, your link will be useful for that. It, it, social media is not just Facebook. It, it, social media is just a word to encompass a platform where people can collaborate in real time. And if they're collaborating about work and they're collaborating about a particular project that they're on or they're collaborating about a learning event they've just attended or they're, they're doing something of that nature, then that is incredibly um, relevant and efficient to what they're doing. Um, and, and I think that that's breaking down this concept that social media is Twitter and Facebook. Um, it, it's not. It's, it's just a, a catch-all phrase for how you, how you use technology to fill the gap that, um, that, that normal or traditional social interactions would have had. So you know, previously, and I talked about this water cooler moment, you would have people yeah. standing around the water cooler saying, God, this project's you know, running off schedule. Um, I really need um, a, a resource. And someone would say, oh, you know, actually, I've got someone who's just finished on my project. Perhaps you could have them. Now, then that is a social experience which, which no one would say is invaluable, even though it's not you know, something that's directly done via email or, or, or something like that. So it's just moving that conversation into a technological framework because people don't stand around the water cooler anymore. They're not in the same place as they used yeah. to be. Yeah. Uh, and it's being able to formalize that and, and then capture that information as well so it becomes more valuable than that water cooler moment. Sorry, Helen just noticed the audio is cutting in that. That's because I was typing while um, Mark was speaking. Mike was speaking, probably. I, I think we, well, I know, we're up against the buffer, so we're going to have to stop. We haven't covered all, but there was particularly one issue, well, there's a, a bunch of issues I wanted to cover. Haven't been able to. Um, I think, though, this, I just want to say thank you very much, Mike, for a, a, a great presentation. You know, it only ran for like 35, 40 minutes, but lots of time there for us to then discuss, as we have done in, in some detail, what the issues raised up are and making it very uh, personalized for everybody on, on the call. So thank you very much, everybody, for participating as well. As always, I've learned a lot. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mike Baker of Cornerstone On Demand for your um, very refreshing but, but underpinned by data, which I love, view of how to get yourself uh, up and running with social learning. And please don't forget um, to uh, keep in touch with uh, Mike via his email and Twitter. And of course, if you want to put your own Twitter handles in um, as we close off here, please do so. That will enable us to uh, keep in touch with each other as time goes by. I'm going to go back to the housekeeping and wrap up. If you've enjoyed this session, then uh, please uh, go ahead and let, people, let the world know about it on Twitter. That's the hashtag, hash LSG webinar. The recording the PDF, the uh, text chat will all be available, well, we say from Monday, could even be tomorrow, uh, via the Learning and Skills Group website. It costs nothing, 6,000 people. It's a good example of a nice place where people hang out together properly socially.